let's talk about nitrous oxide for labor analgesia, or maybe uh, labor satisfaction, of which uh, Dr. Uh, Carvella uh, spoke of earlier. Uh, how, just for a show of hands, how many people use nitrous oxide in a labor and delivery suite? Okay, that's good. How many would like to? And okay, how many don't really care? <laughs> okay, so let's uh, move on. So learning objectives. We are going to talk about, we're going to discuss the history of nitrous oxide. We're going to discuss reasons why nitrous oxide is not a popular technique in the United States and why is it, it, it's more popular in other areas of the, of the world. And we're going to discuss indications and contraindications for the use of nitrous oxide. So why don't women use uh, not nitrous oxides? Well, it's really offered all over throughout the, the world. And in fact, 75% of laboring women in the UK use it, 60% of laboring women in Finland use it, and it's also widely used in the United States, in uh, Canada, but not the United States. So why is that? Well, it's simply cultural. Many women make decisions about childbirth based on what they learn from family and friends. Most have never heard of or used nitrous for coping with labor pain. In the United Kingdom, nitrous oxide is just part of life. Women expect they will have access to it. It's in every birth room. It's in every bathroom. I'm not sure we're going to do that in the United States. Uh, but it, it's, it's definitely used. And this was by Holly Kennedy, PhD, and she's a certified nurse midwife. So what about the cost advantages? It is much simpler and less expensive than epidural analgesia. You don't get the complications like a a postural puncture headache and you don't have to treatment, it doesn't result in longer hospital stays. And this was an editorial in the Journal of Birth in 2007. And in fact, if you look at other component groups, ACOG and A1, they have not issued any opinions on the use of nitrous oxide. So it definitely needs to be talked about. So first, one of the objectives is let's talk about the history. So it was discovered by Joseph Priestley in 1772. And the first human trials were done by uh, Thomas Beddoes and Humphrey Davies. And in fact, if you look at the, the book, is right here. And that was published by both of them in 1800. And then it gradually made its way across the, uh, the uh, Atlantic Ocean to the United States. And in fact, another interesting thing is about Samuel Colt. He was born in 1814, and we all know that he uh, patented all kinds of guns. And, and uh, so what he needed to do is he called himself the celebrated Dr. Colt of New York, London, and Calcutta. And what he did is he traveled up and down the East Coast, and he used nitrous oxide. And he charged people 25%. 25 cents to basically make fools of himself so he can get money for his patents on guns. I thought that was pretty interesting. And then we all know that P.T. Barnum and P.T. Barnum Circus, and that was really popular in the olden days for him, but before then, when he was a young person, in 1842, he purchased Barnum's American Museum, which was located in New York City. And it was five floors of changing exhibits. And in fact, it was like the Smithsonian. It was like one of the most visited places in America. And during a six-month period from 1844 through 1845, he had ex exhibitions of laughing gas. So that was pretty interesting. Okay. So the first use as far as uh, 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 use for anesthesia and for surgery was it was a dentist, Horace Wells, and you see him right here. He was getting a tooth extracted, and John Riggs, he extracted the tooth, so he's right here, and Gardner Quincy Colton. He, that gave the nitrous oxide. And that was the first successful use of nitrous oxide where they extracted a tooth. And we all know that uh, it, it went to, uh, in Boston, so that they had the, they tried to do that, an ENT procedure under nitrous oxide, and it miserably failed. And then I think uh, the soap, I'll put a plug in for the soap meeting, it's going to be in Boston in mid-May, and I believe that we are going to visit uh, the amphitheater. So that'll be fun, and, and if you can come, it'll be nice. So in fact, I actually knew all about it, and if you look, at the person in the middle, I'm like right there. And what I'm saying is, <laughs> I have my hands out. Okay, why not? Why is it we, we need to do something different? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So that was a Colombian Congress, and it was funny. When we were there, you could get a picture taken, so I got it, so that's good. All right, so now the another controversy about uh, inhalational anesthesia, nitrous is part of it, is ether anesthesia. And on the left, you see uh, Morton and William Morton. He was a dentist, and he published about the use of ether anesthesia in 1846. But also in 1842, Crawford Long, he published about Ether too, who was a physician. So it's funny, when you go to Boston, they uh, honestly believe that uh, William Morton, who's a dentist, uh, discovered Ether anesthesia. And there's a statue of him, and I think we'll be able to see that too if you come to soap. And also Crawford Long, he's in Atlanta. So he has his statue about discovering Ether anesthesia. And it really, if you, if you talk about it, and use it is that Crawford Long, he used it a lot, as did William Morton, but Morton published it. So technically, that's why there's like this fight. So if you come up with a good idea, you need to publish it, and then hopefully you can keep it. So that's the, the big uh, two cents out of that. So FDA approval, it, it, it's funny, we did a, a study in my former place of employment using nitrous oxide, and it's, oh, it's going to you know, cause damage, and what about the neonates and all that? First thing is, is it FDA approved? So if you look at it and, and looked at it, it's definitely FDA approved. So there's all the indications that you can see. Uh, Pre-hospital anesthesia, so someone having an acute angina, acute heart attack, it's definitely used for dental procedures. You can use it for sedation. Uh, general anesthesia adjunct, we use it a lot. Also myocardial infarction, and if you look right here, yes, it, it's FDA approved for labor analgesia. So you can use it, it's not a, a problem. And in fact, the ASA designates uh, the use of nitrous oxide as less than 50% or 50% as minimal sedation. And that's going to be important where does the anesthesia need to be in the room? And, and really, they don't, and we'll discuss that later. So as far as the use of nitrous oxide, molecular weight of 44, it's heavier than air, it's colorless, it's sweet, it's, it's like sevoflurane. So you can go ahead and take breaths and it, it's not gonna uh, make you, it's not um, make you uh, uh, intolerant against it. It's easy to administer, it has a low vapor pressure, it has minimal toxicity, cardiotoxicity, it really, it hardly depresses anything, so it's safe to use. It doesn't trigger malignant hyperthermia, but the main reasons to use it is two things, anxiolysis, analgesia, and um, anxiolysis. So the mechanism of action is within the CNS. It's the cerebral cortex. It does modulate pain, and specifically, it can modulate the descending spinal cord nerve pathways. It, does, it acts at the mu receptor. It also acts at the MDA receptor. And in fact, as with the mu receptor, you can reverse some of the effects uh, by giving uh, Narcan. So central nervous system, it has very distinct pharmacokinetics. It has a quick onset and quick offset. So that's what's nice about it. It's rapidly titratable. It does cause CNS depression, and it can depress uh, all the uh, sensations, pain, temperature, touch, uh, and auditory. You can get sleepiness, mood alterations. You can get a feeling of euphoria. So that's that narcotic effect. Uh, mentation can be impaired. You can get loss of, loss of tactile sensations. You can get dysphoria. And you, if you give it too much or too high of a concentration, you can get inappropriate behavior, giddiness, laughing, and crying. That can be seen. So what about uh, other pharmacology? effects. So it has minimal effects on the cardiovascular system. In fact, in someone that's really anxious or they're having labor pain, it's not uncommon with the use of nitrous oxide for their blood pressure to decrease and also their heart rate to decrease to come back to baseline levels before they were in labor. The respiratory system, negligible effects. It wrap it in, wrap it out. There's, there's no metabolism. It's not an airway irritant. It doesn't increase mucus production, and it doesn't cause bronchospasm. As far as selection, really the biggest failure is to not pick the, the, the correct patient or the proper person. Poor patient selection is where you're going to get into trouble. It is a weak anesthetic, and it does have limited anxiolysis and analgesia. So it's not for everyone. And in fact, about maybe 20% of uh, patients uh, will not get any benefit from it. So along with patient selection, you have to have patient cooperation, because they're going to have to tell you that they're feeling the effects 
and, and uh, telling you that their pain is much better. So exchange of information is real critical. So there's three generally accepted categories, analgesia, alleviation of pain, and also stress reduction. So nitrous oxide does elevate the, the pain threshold. And another safe thing is, is because moms are having a lot of pain, so by using nitrous oxide, the, the pain threshold is already elevated. So by using nitrous, it, it gives you a little mo more margin of safety. It doesn't replace an adequate local or regional anesthetic. And the big thing that's coming out in the literature is really not the analgesia come part of it. It's more of the anxiolysis or the, the dissociation. So even though you might feel the pain, you're dissociated from it. And that's the big effect of nitrous. And in fact, instead of using nitrous just for like labor analgesia, it's more of a, like a satisfaction type thing, a dissociation. That, oh, it's OK. It's fine. It, even though I feel it, I don't associate it with being painful. So it can't be, uh, it's counterproductive for the level of pain, like I said, because it does the dissociation. So really instead of, and what Brendan was alluding to, it's not just the analgesia per se, but it's the whole experience. It's the patient satisfaction. So that is probably more relevant than looking at pain surveys. So many women who have used it in the past choose to use it again in subsequent uh, pregnancies. So although it might not change the, the analgesic scale, the satisfaction scale, the full experience, and that's really what we want to give. So contraindications is poor choices for nitrous is excessive fear and anxiety. It's not going to be good because you need cooperation. They're going to have to breathe through the mask. Inability to communicate a reason. They're going to have to tell you that, it, that, that it's helping, you know, it, and that it's useful. The inability to hold the face mask or mouse teeth. Someone that has a vitamin B12 deficiency because um, it, it wouldn't be good and you can have um, uh, inadequate metabolism. Uh, upper respiratory tract infection, that's mainly for the hoses and stuff that are in there. You wouldn't want to cause, um, put uh, uh, microorganisms into the system. And people with severe lung disease, because nitrous oxide expands much more rapidly than air, it can it expand the pressure and also a volume thing. You want to be careful. And patients that have severe lung disease, it's probably not a good idea with someone that has severe pulmonary hypertension, too, because uh, it can cause a constriction. So epidural analgesia, so nitrous oxide, so everyone compares nitrous oxide to labor analgesia. Epidural analgesia is definitely the gold standard. And, that's what, and I'm not here to say that we shouldn't use it. But sometimes there is a, there's a 5 to 15% epidural anesthesia failure rate. And it, what's important here is that many women are not willing or able to have an epidural and must opt instead for parental opioids. So in someone that has like uh, scoliotic surgery, that has uh, rods in their hair, can rods in their back, or they don't want a, a spinal, they're really scared, or what, why can't they have uh, nitrous oxide? Why do you have to go to parental opioids? Or what I'm thinking is we can fill the gap or fill the need. So nitrous oxide can be one more tool that we can use to have a better labor experience for the mom. Indications. So laboring women. So it's not just for labor analgesia. There's a lot of other things we could use it for. It's clearly for early labor. And another thing, too, is just because you use nitrous oxide and they don't deliver with nitrous oxide, and maybe instead of getting the labor epidural at two centimeters, and if you could delay it to maybe eight or nine centimeters or seven centimeters, is that a failure? I, I would say no. I would submit that it's definitely no. It can also be used for forceps and, and vacuum extractions, episiotomy repair. I was speaking with uh, uh, some of the nurse midwives, and they said they'd love to use it. So they're in a second stage of labor, and it's just a lot of painful. So they're already in the room anyhow. They're delivering. Why couldn't you use nitrous oxide to supplement it and make it a better positive experience? So other removal of placenta, uterine expiration, uh, bedside D and C. So all those are good. And in, in fact, IV initiations. There's been studies where it, they, they use nitrous oxide to place IVs in the emergency room department, and it, it makes it a lot easier. And in fact, even maybe using it for labor epidural placement if someone is, is really anxious and nervous. So there's a lot of indications. So you can use that as that piece of a puzzle to fill in the gaps. 
use in pregnancy. It has a long track record if, if, with very safe outcomes. Like I said, used a lot in the UK, Finland, and also in Canada. It provides adequate analgesia for many women, but not all. And it's as efficacious as TENS. It's better than opioids, but it's less effective than epidural analgesia. So that's where it fits in. So necessarily, you don't have to go straight to parenteral uh, narcotics. So maybe uh, nitrous oxide might be a good fit. So and it is safe for the portorian, and it's also for people in attendance, and it's also safe for the neonate. It has no effect on uterine contractility. It does cross the placental barrier, but it has minimal effects. It's not teratogenic, especially when we're in the third trimester or second trimester when or organogenesis is also complete. It's a good choice because of rapid in, rapid out, minimal metabolism. There's no effect to the fetus. It doesn't alter the APGAR scores, and there's really no changes in norbehavioral scores, and it's also safe for breastfeeding. As far as pre uh, patient preparation, you need proper uh, cycle. You have to explain to the patient that what they're getting is with the nitrous. Describe what you're trying to achieve with the nitrous and make sure that they're able, able to understand. You can tell them that they're not going to be totally put to sleep, that they'll be aware of their surroundings at all time. They'll be aware when it's time to deliver and push. It's not amnestic, so they will remember the whole experience and they'll be able to feel their contractions. And I just tell them, you know, probably instead of feeling pain, it's gonna be more like a pressure type thing. As far as operating procedures, tell them what they're gonna feel and, and try and explain what, what's gonna happen. Uh, tell them that they're gonna feel relaxed and remain cooperative and they'll be in charge and in control at all times. And really the simple monitoring that you really need to do is the three C's. Is, are, there, are they gonna be conscious? comfortable and cooperative. And as long as they do all three, you're all good to go. And if there's any change in that, excessive sedation or what, uh, the irrational behaviors and things like that, then it's time to move on and maybe go with another mode of um, analgesia. So recognition of these symptoms is paramount too. So when they start complaining of feeling uncomfortable, maybe sluggishness, if they're perspiring a lot, sweating, uh, inappropriate behavior, becoming uncooperative, or it's just not working, time to move on to plan B. So maybe a labor epidural, maybe narcotics, uh, whatever needs to be done. Okay, so I know uh, it was funny. I did talk to the, the Porter people, the nitrous oxide, so they have a, a booth, and if you want to go ahead and talk to them, you can. I can tell you I have no uh, financial uh, things with them, so I'm just uh, talking on a, the use of it just for labor. So there's two different types, and there's the scavenging and non-scavenging. If you're going to use it, you really have to use the scavenging because you don't want to cause problems with fertility. And this is the non-scavenging, and that's the good, like in the ambulances. So, you know, the, the uh, uh, evolving MIs and stuff, you can use it. So this Porter system right here, that's the one, and it's really the only one that's approved in the United States, and that's the one we use that uses the scavenging system. So uh, patient use, you just tell them that it's intermittently that they self-administer. So it has to be them, just like a PCA button when they push it. You self-administer. You definitely want to do it. Probably it takes about a minute before you get the full effect. So if you have contractions every two minutes, once you start noticing that the contraction's coming, that's when you start breathing it so that it, you have a peak effect uh, uh, when the, when it, the contraction um, it begins. So about 30 to 50 seconds is what you need. And uh, the key safety features is that only the woman gets to do it. So she just uses it, and then when it's done, she does it, she puts it away. The big thing about this, this mask is, is that it has a negative pressure valve in it. So when they take a deep breath, then the valve opens, you get the nitrous. When they don't breathe, the valve closes. So that's really important, and that's a key safety fe feature of it. In the second stage, it's recommended to take really two to three deep breaths before each push and consider other alternatives like a pudendal block or uh, additional local infiltration if you're going to deliver vaginally. Uh, the, the combination is when you start mixing drugs, so nitrous oxide with like 
analgesics and narcotics, uh, it can easily render a woman more sedated. So discharge criteria, quickly and quickly acted out. Do they have to stay in the PACU? No, absolutely not. They're pretty much going to be the same as they were before. Soon after about five minutes, they can go straight to the floor. There's no reason to keep them behind or monitor just because they had nitrous oxide. So safety features is the big thing. Is to, you always get a 50-50 mix uh, of nitrous and oxygen. It's built in an oxygen, uh, oxygen fail-safe. So when, if there's no oxygen that's running, it automatically shuts off. And then I told you about the demand flow, negative pressure. So when they breathe, that, that valve opens. And when they, they don't breathe, it closes. So those are the big safety features. Now, what the, these porter systems have is they have the E, e cylinders and oxygen and nitrous. So we all know that oxygen starts, it's purely gas, so it starts at about 2200, and it's almost like your gas tank in the car. It pretty much goes down to zero. The problem with nitrous is that it's also a liquid phase, so it's always going to reach 760 way to the very end until it becomes all of a gas. So that, that's why it's good to have two cylinders of nitrous oxide, so you always have it available. <laughs> Scavenging systems, they have it. It's really important to use it because it, you, we, as far as fertility, and there's two different types. There's a manual uh, type you can just carry along, and then there's one that you can just push in. And I did speak with the, the people, and they said that to, it probably needs change, the scavenging system, uh, the filters, like once a year or something, and it's very inexpensive uh, to go ahead and, uh, and change it. So the big thing is, is what about fertility? And you know, I'm not you know, going to be able to, my significant other will not be able to have kids and all that. So there is data in the dental profession that, that it, there are slight increases in infertility, spontaneous abortions, and preterm labor, especially in the 1990s. But there's no association with the use of, of nitrous oxide in the labor and delivery suite. If you look at how we're different, how dentistry is different, is if you look here, here's where the nitrous is coming. The dentist is sitting off to the side and a dental hygienist is sitting off to the side. There's also not that demand valve in there. It's just the nitrous is just free flowing with the nose. So basically everyone's breathing it. So it's different in, in the labor and delivery suite. And then also there's a better ventilatory systems. And, and I can tell you that you, there's a lot of um, places that they use a badge to monitor nitrous concentrations. And it's very minimal, if at all, when they use the nitrous uh, badge monitoring. So, and then the, another big question is the neuroapoptosis. And we all know, and this is very big in the pediatric literature, pediatric anesthesia, and it's generally most worrisome from the third trimester to three years of age. And practically all anesthetic drugs that we use can do it. So to just blame it on nitrous oxide, you can't do that. All inhalational anesthetics can do it, in, including like Sevo and, and Desflurane. And also IV medications can cause apoptosis. And the only thing I can say is, is that if you look at this, this just basically shows, if you look at the Global Education League table, and this is the measure of overall rank and how educated are we, in the United Kingdom, and it said it's used a lot in the United Kingdom for hundreds of years, they're ranking higher than us, 26%. In the United States, we're, we're 30, whatever, 38%. So I can tell you that even that they're using nitrous and their scores are higher in the United States. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> occupational risk. So if they talk about the, the occupational exposure limits, OELs, and that's over an eight hour period. And we, it, for the NIOSH recommends that it's 25 parts per million. You need to stay less than that for nitrous oxide. For inhalational anesthetics, it's five parts per million. The European limit is 100 parts per minute, and animal data suggested exposure levels greater than 500 is really what you need to cause problems uh, with uh, fertility and organogenesis. So the several steps that we need to do is we need to vent the scavenging, have a scavenging system is really important, and then also routine equipment maintenance. So it's really important. And, Probably since anesthesia maintains all, the, all the, the ventilators and stuff, it probably wouldn't be bad if you did it just to go ahead and maintain it. It would be a good idea. So as far as nurse and advanced practice provision is that hospital staff are not required to be present in the room. And that, that was uh, published in ANA in 2011. 
most nursing practice acts do not allow for an RN to administer gases. They're not administering gases. With nitrous oxide, it's the patients that's administering their own gas. So when they say, oh, nurses can't be doing that, they're not doing that. Uh, the other issue is that, as I said, the ASA classifies this as minimal sedation. So you don't need it. In CMS, they don't, like non-anesthesia providers, they don't recognize moderate or deep sedation as anesthesia provision, and therefore you don't need to be in the room. So direct anesthesia presence is not required. Nitrous oxide is minimal sedation. It's just one medication. So in conclusion, pain cannot be defined satisfactory except as every woman defines it for herself. There's psychological, there's physiological factors, and there are reactions to pain that produce variations in the pain threshold. So it really, it should be maternal choice matters, and having labor, having nitrous oxide as an additional tool is, is um, it probably a good thing. And it's also good for uh, when you're advertising. It's really important that if you can have it, you can offer it, and it's a key thing. So that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.